sound. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Kenan from Cars and Bids and today we're talking about five sports cars that you can get for right around $45,000, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. You see, last year I sold my beloved Ferrari F355 Spider with no reserve on Cars and Bids. And ever since, people have been asking me what am I going to get to replace it? Then to be honest with you, I don't really feel like spending $100,000 on another sports car right now. I also don't want one that's crazily unreliable like the F355 is known for being. And so it got me thinking about what cars can I get for around $45,000 that are still cool, interesting, and exciting. And so conveniently, today, we're going to be discussing that exact list. And with that, let's get started. Before we get going though, there is some criteria that I came up with for this list as it's personalized to, well, me. And so I wanted to clarify exactly what those were. First thing is that I want cars with manual transmissions. I personally have never owned an automatic car, only manuals, and I want to keep it that way for the foreseeable future. I understand that there are a lot of cool cars that were only offered as an automatic or the automatic version is much more popular and available at the price range I'm talking about, but for me specifically, I wanted to focus on cars that you could get with a third pedal. I also wanted the car to be relatively exotic, and so that means I considered mostly European stuff. I know there are American sports cars and Japanese sports cars that I can certainly get in this price range, but I wanted to come up with stuff that was a little bit more exotic and had a little bit more flair to it, and so most of the examples I use for this are European. The last thing I took into consideration is reliability. I tried to choose cars that were a little bit more reliable and had a shot at at least not completely draining my bank account unlike my F355. So those are the criteria that I was considering when I came up with this list. And so let's jump in with the first car. The first car on my list is the 1992 to 1995 Generation 1 Dodge Viper. This car is pretty crazy. <laughs> of all the cars on this list, this is definitely the craziest, but it's also the most iconic. Originally developed in the late 1980s, the Dodge Viper set out to redefine what an American sports car could be, an American supercar to truly take on European rivals. The concept was released in 1989 at the North American International Auto Show, and it created a huge flurry of excitement. This car looked outlandish, and people were really excited about it and wanted it to go into production. Then in 1991, at the Indianapolis 500, Carroll Shelby drove a pre-production version of the Viper around the track, and it got people really enthused about the Viper, and eventually the car would go into production in 1992. Dodge was also under a lot of pressure from the United Automobile Workers Union to replace the Stealth as its range-topping sports car. That was really a Mitsubishi 3000 in costume, it wasn't a homegrown American sports car. And so in 1992, Dodge would put the Viper into production, giving everybody the American Halo car that they wanted. It's fitting that Carroll Shelby was the one to drive the Viper at the time, as it was seen as a modern-day incarnation of the famed Shelby Cobra. And just like that car, it was supposed to be a lightweight sports car that had a big thumping engine. And Dodge was very dedicated at making sure that the Viper weighed very little, mostly by getting rid of stuff that uh, you might need. For instance, it had no traction control, no ABS, no airbags, no exterior door handles. There's nothing in the Viper that did not need to be there, but that doesn't mean that they didn't invest in real development for this car. For instance, it had fully independent double wishbones at all four points to make sure that the car handled as well as possible. They also worked with Lamborghini to develop the V10 that was found in this car, most notably by using Lamborghini's expertise with making aluminum engines, as the Viper has an aluminum engine block. The result is that the Viper weighed in at 3,285 pounds, relatively light by modern day standards, but a significant chunk of that weight was due to the engine that Dodge decided to put in the Viper. They would use an 8 liter naturally aspirated V10 that produces 400 horsepower and 465 foot pounds of torque. And the Viper could get from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 4.6 seconds, which for 1992 was some stellar performance. The first gen cars are particularly attractive because they got side pipes. The second generation cars did away with those and they changed away from the famed three spoke wheel design and would update other parts of the Viper to make it a little bit more modern. They would also offer a coupe GTS version of the car as opposed to the stripped out convertible car that had, well, no exterior door handles. These days you can get the first generation Viper for between thirty and $45,000 and it's a very compelling car in that price segment as 
I can't think of anything else that is more iconic than that. These cars also have a reputation for reliability, although they have some issues that can crop up with the head gaskets, repairs are relatively inexpensive for these cars, and parts prices are very low, which make it really attractive. And so the Dodge Viper offers an iconic design, great performance, relative reliability, and a very analog driving experience. And for around $45,000, well, it certainly deserves to be on this list. The next car on my list is the Lotus Elise. Hardly a surprise to find it in a list of sports cars in this price range, but the Lotus Elise was a big deal. When it was released in 2000, it replaced the first generation Elise, which was never offered in the United States. But Lotus announced that they would be bringing the Elise eventually to the US market, and this got people very excited for this car. The Elise was special in that it iterated on the first generation car, but it used more advanced technology in its development. For instance, it was the first Lotus to be developed using CAD, or Computer Assisted Design. Famously, the Elise was powered by the 2ZZGE Toyota Drive 1.8 liter in line four, and it produced about 190 horsepower, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. However, the Elise was also famously very light. It had a curb weight of reportedly 1,984 pounds, and it had a gross weight of around 2,500 pounds. Very, very light, especially by modern day standards. The Elise could also get from zero to 60 miles an hour in 4.9 seconds. And so when it came out for the summer of 2004, it offered a lot of performance at the time. And these cars have been regarded as being truly sensational. Their handling characteristics are amazing and they're really wonderful sports cars to drive. Because of their Toyota drivetrain, they're also known for being relatively reliable. These cars are really compelling, especially in the $45,000 price segment and well, it naturally deserves to be on this list. While I'm talking about Lotus though, an honorable mention has to go to the Lotus Evora, which is also available in this price range of sort of 35 dollars to $45,000. That was a supplementary car built in companion with the Elise, except this car was a two plus two. It had four seats, but it was also offered with a manual transmission, had V6 power, had double wishbones all around, and was a very competent sports car. More GT focused than the Elise was, but these cars are also around the same value. My opinion, a lot of look for the money, and it should be something that's considered in this price range. The next car on the list that I want to discuss is one that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the BMW M Coupe, the clown shoes, specifically the S54 powered cars. Interest in these cars has really taken off over the last several years, but the S54 cars have kind of settled down and you can get a decent one with some miles for around $45,000. And this is a really interesting car. Famously, BMW developed this car in secret. Engineers wanted to produce a coupe version of the already very competent M Roadster. They knew that by giving the car a hard top, they could dramatically increase its structural rigidity. And well, they achieved it. The coupes were 2.6 times more structurally rigid than their Roadster brethren. To keep costs down on this car, BMW engineers used parts from other cars, a parts bin special, and that's exactly what the M Coupe was. They used a lot of suspension components from the E30 and E36, but they would also use components from the E46, specifically with the S54 engine. The car was offered with two engines in the United States, the S52, which was shared with the E36 M3, and the S54, which was shared with the E46 M3. In US spec, that engine would produce 316 horsepower and 251 foot-pounds of torque, and that engine was relatively rare in the M Coupe. It was only produced for two model years, 2001 and 2002, and BMW only made 678 M Coupes with S54 power, making it one of the most rare modern-day production BMWs. The M Coupe in either form was only available with one transmission and that was a five-speed manual. There was no automatic version and the car was never offered with a six-speed. The reason being that this was the entry-level, less expensive M car. And so giving it a six-speed would move it right into the firing line of the E46 M3. And BMW did not want to do that. And so they neutered it with a five-speed manual instead. The S54 clown shoe offers a lot. It offers that crazy quirky design, love it or hate it, admittedly, but it also offers great performance, a wonderful six-cylinder engine, manual transmission, rear-wheel drive, great driving dynamics, and it's extremely rare. These cars with some miles in some less exciting colors have settled in to the $45,000 price range. Now, I do remember a time when these cars were less expensive than that, but I also remember a period of time when these cars were a lot more expensive than that. 
And like I said, they have kind of settled down. And while you can still get very low mileage cars in rare color configurations for a lot more, you can find them in this $45,000 price range. And if you're a BMW addict, well, it belongs on your list. No list like this would be complete without a depreciated Porsche on it. And so I've taken a lot of models into consideration as for $45,000, you can get some pretty notable Porsches, but probably the best of those would be the 997.1 generation Carrera S. Introduced in 2004, this car marked a return to form to Porsche as gone were the questionable fried egg headlights of the 996 and in their place were beautiful, more contemporary oval units. But in addition to design, Porsche also focused a lot on the chassis of this car as they wanted to improve it over the 996. Their approach would change in the development of this car in that they would start with the convertible version first. The idea being that if you develop a stiff chassis for a convertible, when you put a hardtop roof on it, you only gain benefits. It only gets stiffer from there. A very similar idea actually to what BMW did with the M Coupe. The 997 would also get slightly wider than the 996 it replaced. It would grow by 3.5 inches in width, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a pretty substantial difference, and it allowed the car to be even more stable on the road compared with its predecessor. Porsche would then set out to improve the base car by offering an S version of it starting in 2005, and this gained you a lot of things. Most notably, your engine displacement grew from 3.6 to 3.8 liters, and power accordingly went up, gaining 29 horsepower and bringing the figure to 300. 155 horsepower for the Carrera S. Porsche Active Suspension Management, better known as PASM, would also become available on the Carrera S, as would 19-inch wheels, a sport exhaust system, by xenon headlights, and other special touches like that to differentiate it and generally improve it from the base car. Admittedly, in this price range, you can get a variety of different Porsches, but I chose the 997.1 Carrera S because it's such a well-rounded package. You can use this car for daily commuting if you want, you can use it for backward driving, you can even take it to the track if you really feel like it. You can also put things in it, and some admittedly relatively small people, and these cars are pretty reliable. Some early ones did struggle with the IMS issue just like they did with the 996, but generally if it's been remedied, it's been documented, and there are fixes to this if you want to go down that route. Regardless, these cars are very highly regarded, and it's pretty incredible that you can get one for 45 grand. It offers a lot for a lot of different driving purposes. And now it's time to talk about the proverbial elephant in the room, the car I've been standing around and sitting inside of this whole time, and that is the Aston Martin V8 Vantage, specifically the 4.3 liter version of this car, as opposed to the later 4.7 liter V8 Vantage. This car offers a lot of benefits that I'll get into, but one of the biggest that it offers is the way it looks. This car was penned by Ian Callum and worked on by Heinrich Fisker. And while well, it's just drop dead gorgeous, even today, this car looks astonishingly beautiful. In its time, it was also regarded as being very pretty, especially compared to the Porsche 911, the 997 that I just mentioned, which is certainly not an ugly car, but I mean, come on, look at this thing. But the beauty of this car isn't just skin deep. When you open the hood, you're greeted with the beautiful 4.3 liter Aston Martin V8. And this engine is a sweetheart. Originally, this engine was derived from a Jaguar V8, but to call it a Jag V8, no, that's not really accurate. Aston Martin made a lot of changes to this engine. Most notably, they would take the cylinder bore and they would increase it, but they would decrease the stroke as the focus of this engine was horsepower. In order to do that, you want a very wide piston that doesn't have to move up and down all that much. It can move up and down very quickly. That will give you more horsepower than torque, and that's what Aston Martin did with this engine. They would also give it dry sump lubrication in an effort to get the engine as low as possible, decreasing its center of gravity, making it handle nicer, and they were able to give it the beautiful low shut line for the hood. In addition to the major architecture change for this engine, Aston Martin would also change the intake and exhaust manifolds, the pistons, connecting rods, crankshaft, camshafts, and a lot more with this engine. They would also develop their own engine management software for it in-house so that they could tune it how they like. So to call this a Jaguar engine, eh, that's not really accurate. Aston Martin made a lot of changes to make it something really special. The result is that this engine makes 380 horsepower and 302 foot-pounds of torque, and it's enough to power this car from 0 to 60 miles an hour in around 4.9 seconds. Plenty of performance, and it's in line with the other cars we've discussed so far. 
But brawn <laughs> is nothing without balance. And Aston Martin wanted to make sure that the V8 Vantage was a very well-balanced sports car. And they accomplished this by using the transaxle layout. That is, they mounted the transmission at the rear of the car. The result is that this car has a 49% front, 51% rear weight balance, almost perfect. And that was really important to Aston Martin as, again, they were taking on the 911, which is a famously very poised and well-balanced sports car. And so Aston Martin, in order to give it a fighting chance, took up this design and, well, they did a wonderful job making sure that it was a very balanced platform. And now we move back inside the V8 Vantage to talk about the various configurations you could get this car in, as there are quite a few. There are two different V8 models you could get throughout the production run, the 4.3 liter engine, which this one has, and the 4.7 liter engine. The 4.7 was introduced in mid-2008, and cars produced after that all got the 4.7 liter engine. The idea with that engine is that although Aston Martin had targeted horsepower with the developments they'd made compared to the Jaguar V8, they wanted to reintroduce displacement and give the engine a little bit more torque so it had a little bit more punch right out of the box. Aston Martin would also offer a couple different versions of the V8, including an S variant, and they would offer a V12 version of this car as well, cramming their huge famed Aston Martin V12 into the relatively small body of this car, making it a real hot rod. But I want to focus on the 4.3 liter cars as there are some very important differences to consider if you're looking at one of these cars. The first is the body style. This car was offered as a coupe and as a convertible. The coupes are substantially more common than the convertibles are. And getting even more granular than that comes the transmission. This car was offered in both a six-speed manual transmission and Aston Martin's sequential manual gearbox known as Sport Shift. Although the manuals are relatively common in the coupes, they are very rare in the convertibles. You don't see them as often as that car was designed to be more of a cruiser and, well, the cutting edge technology of the day was the single plate semi-automatic gearbox. And as a result, you see a lot of the Roadster versions without a manual transmission. Regardless, you could get either the car with three pedals and they're very desirable with those manuals. You can get a sports shift transmission car for much less, but if you're looking for a manual transmission, well, you're going to pay closer to the $45,000 mark that I described before. The good news is that these cars are relatively common, as this was a very successful model for Aston Martin. And over its production run from 2006 until 2018, Aston Martin would produce 15,417 coupes and 6,231 convertibles. So, although a manual 4.3 convertible is relatively rare, the V8 Vantage in general is a relatively common car, as Aston Martin made quite a few of them. The benefits of this car to me are very apparent. It's gorgeous looking for starters, and it has an amazing engine, a manual transmission, really nice build quality, all of the materials in here are really nice, and these cars have a reputation for being relatively reliable. Our very own Doug DeMiro had one of these cars back in the day, and he tells me that really very little ever broke on him. The car was pretty stout throughout his ownership and nothing really outside of regular maintenance was needed to be done despite having his bumper to bumper unlimited mile warranty. And now we get to the best part of my job and that is that we get to take this thing out for a drive. I've never driven a V8 Vantage before so I'm really eager to drive this one as it's really high on my list. So let's take it for a drive. Okay, it's time to drive. The Aston Martin V8 Vantage. These cars, I've loved these cars forever. I think the Aston Martin Vantage in particular is one of the best looking cars to come from its, from its era. The DB9 is beautiful too, but I always felt there was something about the proportions of the Vantage that made it one of the best looking cars that Aston made at the time, which is high praise considering every car that Aston made during this thing's period of time was bite the back of your hand beautiful. This car in particular though um, is kind of exactly what I want. I want a 4.3 liter uh, example. I want a manual transmission. Those are the big things. I really do want the convertible as I mentioned. Um, I think living where I do in San Diego, when you can have a convertible you should have one uh, because the weather here is so beautiful and so I want to take advantage of that. But uh, as I have found and as again as I've mentioned finding a manual transmission roadster really difficult. They didn't make many of those, so. But nonetheless, the coupes are around, and if I can't find a Roadster, I can certainly see getting a coupe in instead. It's not a bad consolation prize as, uh, as consolation prizes go. Oh, and regardless, that sound. Oh, 
Oh man, even with the windows up and the valve not fully open, because I know there's a fuse you can pull where basically the exhaust is loud all the time. I kind of like that this one doesn't seem to have that done. It's, it's, it's sedate driving around, you're not upsetting people, but then you get on it. Oh, that sound is really good. Oh, so nice. The other thing that strikes me right away driving this car is how nice the shifter feels. Like this is a very solid feeling transmission. You feel like you're doing something. It's not as like maybe precise as like a Porsche shifter or something like that, but oh, it's like, uh, it's just, it's got heft to it. And it's such a short throw. It's just really satisfying to use. Oh, oh man. Ooh, it sounds awesome. You know, the other thing is like, I'm not going very fast. I'm doing 40 miles an hour, <laughs> and it, but it, it sounds just so good. Man, that's uh, the, the core competency of this car really, I think is the experience and specialness and design and the engine. Those are the two main reasons you buy it. Uh, some other things that strike me right away, while the controls in general, like the clutch feels great, the shifter is really nice, the steering is quite good, then you have some of the negatives of Aston Martin of this year, and that of course I'm talking about the turn signal stock, right out of a Ford Focus, <laughs> and it feels like that, and it's, it feels inexpensive compared to the rest of the car, which still feels pretty premium even now, and on this one after the number of miles it's covered, it still feels pretty great. Oh. But you just kind of forget about it because just that engine is there. Oh, this V8 is just so beautiful sounding. Let's get on it a little bit here. Oh man, that's good. What a lovely, lovely sound. It's not that fast. Like I'm not really going that quickly, although it sounds like I am. So it's certainly, I'm sure the 4.7 delivers that punch and wallop a, a lot more than this one does. But that said, like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm going slowly necessarily. It's still, it's got some pace to it. So it, it, it feels, it feels nice. The brakes also feel great. Uh, you know, you have a little, the, the, doesn't take a lot of pressure on the pedal to make them work. Um, you know, this car has plenty of braking power and I, th I think they, they feel really nice in this one. I will say the ride is definitely stiff. You can tell this isn't, this car has GT credentials. Of course, you can drive this around, you know, pretty much every day without, without too much pain, but it's not like the DB9, uh, where, which is just very soft. This car is definitely sports car focused uh, and it, it certainly feels that way. But the engine just goads you into, you know, the engine, the, the chassis, you can tell, it, it just goads you into bad behavior, <laughs> which, I, which is kind of what you want in a sports car, of course. But this is a very usable car though. I think with the right setup um, in terms of uh, maybe, you know, tires and, and things, you know, I, I think this is a very, daily drivable car. Uh, I think you could enjoy this with great frequency, which is kind of what I'm looking for. Oh yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah, it handles really great. The changes direction very quickly. Wow, yeah, that's a lot, that's a lot of fun. This car really just wants to be driven. And I can tell why people were so excited about this thing when it came out. You had a baby Aston at a really good price point um, that was really made you think twice if you were thinking about getting a Porsche 911 because you get all this style and drama and charm and it still drives great and you have a V8. Uh, I mean, the car was a, com a compelling package when it came out and it's still compelling today. Oh, yeah, wow, that's really good. It reminds me a little bit more of like the E92 M3's V8 that you really have to string it out to you know, get the most out of it. Uh, I mean, 355 was like that too. You have to really use them. These small displacement V8s, the power comes in much higher uh, in the rev range as opposed to a big, you know, thumper with ultra high displacement. That said, you know, it, it's really fun. <laughs> this car is just fun. I think as a convertible, like I said, it would deliver that experience even more, but even as a coupe, I'm really satisfied with this thing. It deserves its place on my list. I'm going to try and restrain my excitement and wait for a convertible, um, but this car drives great.
<laughs> and that is my list of cool, interesting sports cars that you can still get for $45,000. I'm excited about all of the cars on that list, but I'm sure I forgot some. And if there's something that you think that is cool, interesting, exciting, or exotic for around $45,000, comment it down below and I will definitely take it into consideration. And if you've been in the market for a sports car, well, of course, you can check out our wide selection on carsandvids.com. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you very soon. The hunt continues. Goodbye.